Thanks be to God for the many blessings we have. You know what one of your greatest blessings is? You have me. Isn't that great? One of the best blessings I have is you. We have the gift of each other. Isn't that a blessing to be able to walk this journey together? That's why I'm excited for our home fellowship groups tonight. You see that segue? I'm so proud of that segue. You can clap for the segue more than you clap for me. Okay, no. I'm excited for our home fellowship groups where we get to bond together, talk life together, grow closer to one another. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up for our home fellowship groups, there's some, there, I think there's three signups left out there for you to sign up. If you're not familiar with those, those are times where certain people among our, in our congregation, they sign up to host some others of us. And then we check the sign up, sign up, you bring a finger food or dessert, typically something like that. You can look on the list and it will tell you. And then we get to be together. We get to share what's happening in our life, the good stuff, the bad stuff, and pray for one another. So I'd encourage you to plug into our community that way. Because we have our home fellowship groups this evening, we do not have our evening service here at Westside. I believe there's a home fellowship group meeting here. I'm not sure, double check, uh, but there is no service, which also means that if you're here for manna, manna will be distributed uh, in the chapel back where it typically is right after this service. We also have pictures that have, were rescheduled because it was too bad weather. Was it last week that the weather was terrible? Luckily, perfect sunshiny day today, so we're great. I hear, though, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I hear that they will have pictures, rain, snow, or shine. You just may not be outside for those pictures. Is that correct? Sounds good to me. Great. That's what I heard, so I'm going with it. If there's no one here, you heard it from Devon. Oh. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Ushers, would you come? Let's receive our tithes and our offerings this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us. We recognize that, that we are a blessed people. And as we look financially, we recognize that, that in this country we're very blessed. And right now, we give back to you as you've called us to our tithes. And beyond that, our offerings as a as a gift of worship to you. We pray that it be used for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to do a set of four songs, and I would like to invite you to stand, even though it's kind of awkward as we do the offering, um, but to just begin to stand and worship, and then as you feel like you want to sit down, or if you want to kneel, or if you want to walk around the room, or however you, whatever posture you want to take for worship, we invite you to do that. <laughs>
to hear that today, that he wants to journey with us. We are his children. We are his children, children of God. I hope that you, we can wrap our minds around that today and maybe be an encouragement to us today. Oh, 
we are in our Father's house this morning. Praise His name. We are children of God. We like to open our altars up at this time for any that might like to come and just bow in prayer. Some have already started to gather. If you'd like to come and kneel this morning, we invite you to do so. Pastor Isaac's going to lead us this morning in our prayer time. Thank you, God. Thank you that we are children of hope. God, it doesn't always feel that way. But we stand on your promises. We say thank you, God, that we can believe that we are your children. And help us, help us when we don't believe. God, we need your hope. As we think about our own lives and the things around us, there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of things that are messed up. And we need you. We need the Lamb of God who took sin and death pain, brokenness, you took it to the grave. And then you rose from the dead, saying that sin, death, pain, this brokenness has nothing on you, God. You adopted us. You took us as your children, saying that when we are with you, we can overcome. Because as you said, Jesus, in this world we will have trouble. But you have overcome the world and called us to be your children in overcoming the brokenness. So we say thank you, God. Would you help us? Help us to live into that. Help us to not simply know the hope that you give us with our brains, but like deep within us, in our hearts, in our words, in our actions. Help us to know that you are our hope. And help us to bind together, to to grab arms with one another, and to walk in your hope together. Oh, thank you, God. We're excited to hear from you this morning through your servant, Pastor Dave. We're excited to to hear, continue to hear the ways that you are going to call us to you and call us to be people of hope in your world. So right now we, we set aside the distractions. And we say, Spirit of God, fall on us, speak to us. Word of God, would you speak? Your children are listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Been standing for 30 minutes. Did you know that? Yes. Well, welcome to my world. Hello, your world too. Uh, We're going to be ending our study of 1 Thessalonians today. We're in the fifth chapter. The message is entitled, Read the Instructions. Uh, It's not a bad thing to do. But chapter 5, we'll be looking at verses 12 through 22 here in just a moment. I would like to take a moment and express my appreciation and love uh, for some people that are here this morning. Um, Susan Dillo. Uh I can't tell you enough how much uh, Jim and Susan Dillo have meant in our lives to take... uh, Wendy and I on when we were in our early 20s and with absolutely no experience and to love us and care for us and teach us what it meant to be a pastor and how to uh, to just trust the Lord. I thank you, Susan, for you and your husband. How deeply uh, you have impacted our lives. And um, two teenage girls. (laughs) Ha! Right there. There they are. Well, they were teens once upon a time. They used to be a part of my softball team back in Topeka, Oakland. Um, 
we have Sandra and Shelly, and uh, we, were the, we were the best women's team around. I'm just saying. I learned a lot from them, what you can and cannot do when you're coaching a women's softball team. You cannot te treat them the same way you treat the men. They all get mad at you and stop playing. And I found that out one day. And a sage woman by the name of Judy came up to me and said, Dave, you just can't do it that way here. Not with the girls. I said, okay, thank you. And two weeks later, they started playing for me again. But they had a moment. What a blessing it is to have Sandra and Shelly, who were both a part of Wendy and I's youth group. Back in 1981 is when we started ministry in Topeka, Oakland. Wow. How old am I? I must really be old. <laughs> what a privilege it is today to welcome you guys. I'm glad you're here this morning want to uh, draw your attention this morning to this passage of scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 through 22. I'm curious this morning, is there anybody here who has ever had any difficulty whatsoever putting together something you bought? Anybody? Like you just wanted to you just wanted to take it back, didn't you? Like what in the world have I done here? I cannot get this thing together. And, and it's, a, it's a frustrating thing. And, uh, and the, the thing I found to be even more frustrating is my, my lovely wife would say to me things like, David, did you read the instructions? They're in Korean. Turn the page over, David. <laughs> I am not a fast learner, as you know. Well, a lot, not too many weeks ago, about, about three weeks ago, um, my wife left her phone on my car. And uh, I'm driving to work, and I take a corner, and all of a sudden, flashing in front of my window is, I didn't know what it was, to be perfectly honest, but it just went shoo, straight across my window and into the weeds. And I thought, that looked like, looked like a cell phone. Well, I don't own one, so I know it's not mine, but it looked like a cell phone that just went flying by my windshield. I pulled off the side of the road. I looked for it for about 30, 40 minutes. I took out my flip phone. You remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I called Wendy's number and it didn't ring. So apparently it killed itself on its impact. I'm not sure. All I know is that I thought, well, I think that was a cell phone. So I turned around. I went back home and I said, Wendy, is it possible that your cell phone... She goes, it was on your car. And I said, not anymore. It's not on my car anymore. Well, where is it? I don't know. It's, it's in the weeds along the side of the road, and I've looked for about a half an hour. And she, so we went back and we looked for it, never found it. Wendy went and purchased a new phone for herself, and at the time that she was there, she decided it was time for me to enter into the age of Andrew. So I now have an Android phone, and it's a learning curve. Can I tell you? It's a learning curve. And so, you know, not long after I had it, it started ringing. You know with a phone you're supposed to answer it, right? What well, was ringing, and I saw the name Wendy by a little green phone. And I thought, Wendy's calling, so I push it. It's still ringing. I push it. It's still ringing. I've got to answer this. It's windy or there'll be problems to pay later. And so I pushed it and I pushed it. And finally, it stopped ringing. Wendy was gone. I knew I was in trouble. So I was able to figure out how to call her. And I pulled up her number and I pushed Wendy. I said, Wendy, I tried to answer the phone three or four times. And it just wouldn't let me. I kept pushing the button and pushing the button and pushing the button and nothing. And she said, David, you know, there's a little arrow by my name. If you would just swipe it that direction of the arrow, I'll appear. <laughs> oh, let's try it. <laughs> sure enough. Wendy said, and by the way, have you read any of the instructions on your phone? So that was enough of that. It is indeed a phone again, and I enjoy parts of it way better than I ever did my flip phone. I want to tell you something this morning. I want you to listen carefully. Jesus doesn't think any less of me just because I am technologically challenged. 
and neither should you. But I want to tell you I'm thankful I have a purpose. And I'm very thankful that Paul encourages us to explore that purpose that we have in Christ. And he just would encourage us today, read the instructions. You ready? Here's some instructions. Chapter 5, verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in highest regard, in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. And then he wraps up the first letter to the Thessalonians with, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. And we looked at sanctification just a couple weeks ago. So we'll end with the 22nd verse. I'm thankful that I have a purpose. And God and Paul encourages us to acknowledge those who work hard among us and care for them. Hold them in high regard because of their work. Now there's a lot that I'm not very good at, and I just gave you a good example of one thing, but I am amply equipped by the Lord to care for your spiritual needs. I am very grateful for the way that you allow me to lead and preach. I have always and will continue to seek the Lord's word for Westside. You know something else I'm grateful for? I'm grateful, as Paul writes in verse 13, that we, as a body, live in peace with each other. Aren't you thankful for that? You know, it's not that way everywhere. There's a lot of contention and disharmony in a lot of bodies of Jesus Christ, and it ought not to be that way. I think that we should thank God for the peace that we share together. I know that Paul's words to the Thessalonians were equally true for us. We need to remind those who are idle to serve with us. Those who are disruptive to work with us and not against us. In verse 14, to encourage the discouraged. To say to them, God will work with you. God is for you. He's not against you. He'll come alongside you and meet your needs. To enter into, the, into their world and support them, Paul says. To the Thessalonians. In verse 14 he says. Help the weak. Help the weak. By being strong. For them. Haven't there been times in your life. When you have been decimated by something. And you've been kind of almost laid to waste. And, and somebody. From your family. Body of Christ. Comes up to you and stands alongside you. And lifts your arms up. Holds you close to the Lord. Encourages you by being strong. In verse 14, Paul says, Exercise patience with those who might be idle or disruptive or discouraged or weak. Isn't it interesting that if you go back and look at those areas that we can be an encouragement to one another, one of the ways that we're not an encouragement is if we become impatient. If we just want them to just get there a little faster, would you please? <laughs> Like, how does that really help anybody? But we learn to become patient with those who are idle and those who are sometimes disruptive and those who are discouraged and those who need strength. Because we are family and we are in this journey together. They, these are some of the instructions Paul is giving to the Thessalonians and 2,000 years later to us. So I'd like to spend some time, if I could, Looking at the instructions listed in verses 16 to 22. Could I read it one more time? Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
Don't quench the spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test them and hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. The idea is that in these seven instructions, it will keep us fresh and alive and help us to hold off spiritual stagnation. I'm not so sure that the biggest problem with the, world, the church world in today's world is that we have become a little stagnated, a little lethargic. We have not stood up, we have not spoken to, we have just kind of allowed things to occur, and I, I think it would be good for us to become spiritually enlivened again to speak to the needs of the world. As we read the instructions, I, I came across not long ago the, a list of the opposite of spiritual growth. And the, the writer listed it as stagnation. I came across this alarming document entitled The Seven Steps to Stagnation. I found more of myself in the institutional church in each one of them than I wanted to admit. Stagnation is an inevitable result of thinking and saying things like the following. One, we've never done it that way before. So let's not. Two, we're not ready for that. Three, well, we're doing all right without that, so why do it? Four, we tried that once before. <laughs> yeah, we've all heard that. Five, it costs too much. Six, well, that's not our responsibility. It's someone else's. Seven, it just won't work. And my question is, how do you know? We have all experienced uh, things that have not gone as we thought that they would go. I choose not to call them failed things. I choose to call them experiments. It helps me. I tried an experiment. Didn't go so well. I'm going to not try that one too many more times because I am a fast learner. Hence, in bold contrast to those seven steps to stagnation, Paul says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. Don't quench the spirit, don't despise prophecy, test all things and hold fast to what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. Let's look at him just for a little bit this morning. Rejoice always. When the fires of the Holy Spirit are, are fueled by our willingness, there's an uncontainable enthusiasm for the gospel, for the life we have in Christ. People and the wonder of life. Enthusiasm kind of seems, seems to be the key for the life that we're living. Could I say to you this morning that that authentic enthusiasm is a gift from God. It's not the result of your human effort. Have any of you worked really, really hard and not felt so good after you expended all the work? Thinking that somehow this is the thing that will give me an identity or give me the kind of value that I think I need. But the reality is it has nothing to do with my human effort. We've tried in our own strength to become enthusiastic people. I'm just going to try harder to get on board. I'm just going to try to have a different perspective on things, only to find out that we run out of steam and there I am, the same old guy again. Why? It's because I've tried to create something in my own power that only God can give me. And I want to say to you, there is ample enough of God to create in you and I's heart enthusiasm for our life in Christ. Ample enough gift of God. The Greek word for enthusiasm, meaning in God or inspired by God, when we become spirit-filled people, the fire of the Holy Spirit burns out anything which would keep us cold or cautious or constricted. 
That's why I say that enthusiasm is a gift. It is God's own life-affirming, creative, positive spirit who lives inside of me and changes the very outlook of my, my view. And I couldn't do it by myself. But God gave me a different perspective. It's a reason to rejoice. God has changed the way I look at things. I would imagine that most of us are grateful that we see things differently now because of Jesus Christ than we did before. Reason to rejoice. The second one was pray without ceasing. Uh, dare to be an open person. Pray without ceasing is, to, is a culminative friendship with the Lord God. It gives us perspective on that I can talk to God about anything and everything. It does not mean that 24-7 I am going to be constantly in a state of prayer. It means that at any time, anywhere, I can go before the Lord Jesus Christ and offer myself up to Him and talk to Him. It's a relationship, this prayer without ceasing. Many of us uh, have... A really, really close friend that we find ourselves engaged in conversation with a lot. Whether it be on the phone or texting or email or Facebook or whatever ways in which we communicate. It doesn't really matter how we do it as long as I can stay connected with that person. Let me tell you something. There is nothing better than staying connected with the Lord God Almighty. Who is there available to us anytime, anywhere. He wants to talk with you. Do we want to talk with Him? We are completely open in life. We can ask, okay, Lord, what are you going to do with this problem? Okay, Father, how are you going to develop me into the potential that you see? I, I believe you work in all things, Lord. I believe that you work together for good in all things. What's next on your agenda for me, Lord? How's this going to resolve? The great thing about praying constantly is that it keeps us open to channels for the Lord to accomplish what He wants to accomplish in every situation. Instead of being thrown by changes, we can throw ourselves into making changes according to His guidelines, instructions. So authentic spontaneity comes from this consistent companionship of prayer. It is a reason to pray. The third thing, that he says in this instruction is in everything give thanks. Thank God for what he will do. Thank God for everything. Dr. Ogilvy in his book that I have used as a resource for some of this teaching and preaching shares a little story. I thought it was a good story that kind of talks about this idea of giving thanks and everything. Listen to this story. He said, the other day I called a friend with a disappointing report on a project. I said to him, I'm afraid that I have some bad news for you. He said, oh, thank God. And I said, what? He said, well, he said thoughtfully, I want what God wants. If the report is less than what I hope for, then I'm thankful because to, to have something that he has not willed for me would not be the best for me. So thank you for the bad news. Now, that's exactly how we respond to bad news, isn't it? Oh, thank you for that tidbit of horror that's what I've been longing for to have what he wills though if he would just turn it around in us is joy but to have something that he has not willed for me this is a strong word but is spiritual suicide to think that this is what I need, and yet it's not God's will for me, is the thing that brings us into a state of spiritual death and stagnation. But when He wills for us, and we accept it, we give thanks. Even in a report that is less than what we had hoped for. We've got to be ready to play the ball where it is. Be, th be a thank-filled person. That's reason to be thankful. 
The fourth thing is, do not despise prophecies. Consider the future as a friend. Hmm. It helps us to know that the word prophecy is twofold in scope. It is indeed foretelling, as is in Daniel and the prophets and Revelation. The prophetic utterances had a great deal of authority in the church and did for the Thessalonians, for certain. But it is more than just foretelling. Prophecy is also forthtelling of truth. It is taking the word of God and saying, this is what God says, and speaking it forth. We are to act in a way that the Lord Jesus Christ deems valuable and pleasing and we find ourselves uh, I don't know I don't know exactly what I think here but I I think that there's a lot of resistance nowadays to the Word of God not in West Side I hope but in the world general there seems to be a hesitancy to use something as the Word of God for the way in which we live our lives that's what I see. That's how I uh, dissect a lot of the things that I read nowadays. That's how I, when I attend a conference sometimes and I just go, oh my goodness, that is not what we're talking about, is it? Huh. To not despise the prophecy, the, the foretelling of God's word, but also the foretelling of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I say to you that the prophecy of the word of God is a reason to listen. New. And the measure of our lives should be according to what the Lord reveals, not what fits comfortably. Number five. Kind of goes along with that. Test all things and hold fast to what is good. Set courageous goals. I am a person that likes long-term planning. I believe in five-year and three-year and one-year and one-month goals. I can respond to or reject opportunities on the basis of my one-month goals in light of my short and long-range goals. The reason that many of us get frustrated and lose our spontaneity is because we don't know where we're headed. It's just kind of, okay. My wife and I love to travel. Anybody here like to travel? How many of you like to plan the trip as much as actually experience the trip? Isn't that weird? You spend all this time looking at the things that you want to do and you get so excited about it, it's almost more fun putting together the itinerary than it is to actually be there. And then you have some folks that aren't so much the planning type of people. They are kind of, kind of the seat of your pants kind of people. Yeah, there you go. Now I'm a seat of the pants kind of person. Can I even say that? I'm, not, I'm a very spontaneous person. Is that better than seat of the pants? Kind of fly by the seat of your pants? I don't even know what that means. I bet my mother told me that. I'm going to blame her. But this idea that that there are folks that really, really like to set together a plan and an itinerary and, and kind of just, it helps them get ready for the event. And then there are other folks that just kind of, well, let's just go and see what happens. I took my sons, both of them, on senior trips uh, when they graduated from high school. My oldest son, uh, he, I'll share his story, but he's a, he's a baseball nut. <laughs> I love him dearly. My youngest son, not so much. He's an amusement park nut, and I love him dearly, too. He, sometimes the things he makes me ride make me sick, but that's okay. My oldest son and I, we, he graduated from high school, and we, were, we decided that the, the trip he wanted to do was to take a road trip with the royals. I said, man, I have not got enough money for that. But we did anyhow. So we went to Milwaukee, and to Chicago and we saw six games three in Milwaukee and three 
in Chicago. But you see, the problem was I didn't really plan for anything but the baseball game. I mean, that's why we went, isn't it? The rest of it will just happen. We got so sick of looking at each other. And we love each other. But we had no plan. I remember in Chicago, you know, they have all those, those, uh, those, those trains that go all over the city. I decided that the only thing that would fill our day, well, let's just ride the trains all over the city. You know how 18-year-olds love that? Like, are you kidding me, Dad? Is this all you've got? Is this it? Where's Mom? We would have had a real good time if Mom had planned this thing. Spontan spontaneous, uh, that would be spontaneous combustion, I think, because that thing went south quickly. <laughs> but there are folks that really, really like to do the itinerary and set the plans. And I would say to you that there is significant health in knowing where we're headed with Jesus Christ by thinking about what it is is out there in our future. What are we striving for? What are we trying to accomplish? Hold fast to what is good. Set some courageous goals. Look forward. There are a few things which give life more uh, verve than knowing what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God in, in the short and long-range goals of our lives. When we know where we're headed and can, can then react with spontaneity to everything which brings us closer to our destiny and our destination as persons, the Holy Spirit will guide us all along the way. People ask me all the time, Are, do you preach with a manuscript? I see you turning papers up there. And I say, yeah, I take a manuscript up there with me. But there are so many times that you just see me a long way away from the podium, like now, which just kind of give you an idea that even though I have a manuscript which helps me go in my study and my preparation from beginning to ending hopefully in some cognitive manner that's questionable there are times I'm sure that you wonder but the reality is that helps me prepare to share with you and yet I tell you this morning that I do my best to prepare all week long to think about what it is I'm trying to accomplish I write it all down but then I just say okay now Jesus my desire my goal for this day is to get out of your way you helped me in the preparation of something but I do not want to be tied to that because in the moment Holy Spirit I want you to lead me and guide me and direct me where you want me to go so that there is a prepared I don't know if you accept this or not, but there's a prepared spontaneity. Does that make sense? Same thing for us as we prepare to head toward the direction God wants us to go. And then we find ourselves in a, an experience that we didn't know we were going to have. And we just say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for guiding and directing me here. I'm so glad that I have a map to follow. I'm so glad I have a direction in my life. Please, Lord, keep me. Keep me knowing that I'm headed in the right direction. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Set courageous goals. That's a reason to look forward. I have two more. Abstain from every form of evil. Overcome the negative every day by doing good. Evil, for most of us, is simply a distortion of the good. It is anything which, when done, separates us from God or from other people or even from our true selves. Satan is constantly trying to lead us astray or beguile us with the treason of the right thing for the wrong th thing, reason or the wrong thing for the right reason. Evil is fundamentally rebellion. A major part of abstaining from evil is overcoming the tendency to retaliate. To return evil for evil. Could I ask you this morning, what good does that do? What good does it really do to return an evil action with an evil action? Think of it in terms of 
the desire for retribution. When we are hurt, we want to hurt back. The temptation to return evil for evil is always present within humanity. The spontaneous person does not quench the Holy Spirit's nudging to take the first step toward bringing reconciliation. Did you know that if there's going to be reconciliation within the lives of two people or a bunch of people, somebody's going to have to take the first step? Did you know that? Who's going to do that? That's a fair question. Somebody is going to have to make that step forward to restore that which is broken. But as long as I feel that it's my right to be angry or it's my right to not be involved with you, we will continue to not be engaged with one another. And I want to say to you this morning, there is nothing good about that. You listening to me? There is nothing good about being separated and broken in relationships with people. It is not healthy for you. It is not healthy for them. And it is not healthy for the church of Jesus Christ. Someone has to step forward to establish the forgiveness for the reconciliation. Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. What better description could there ever be for overcoming evil than to be a child of God's? That's reason to forgive. My conclusion this morning is this. If we'll follow these instructions that Paul gives us, we will always be okay. For the Lord said, or Paul said, through Paul, through Paul, Paul said, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. As I think about that this morning, I think that the strongest admonition to you and I this morning is to let God be God. And when he moves, let him move. When he challenges your heart to make it something different, let him do what he's wanting to do. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. I think the problem is when we begin to start the process of quenching the Holy Spirit, it won't be that long before we won't even recognize the Spirit talking to us anymore. And the goal and the instruction is, don't run away from the Spirit's conviction, but run to Him when He convicts you, so that He might indeed do in you what needs to be done. And then we find ourselves, okay. I'm okay. These instructions have taught me well how to live my life and how to recognize that Jesus Christ has a desire for me that is for the good of me. I'm okay. Read the instructions. They're right here. They're simple. And if you read this on your own, you don't have to spend the next 35 minutes like I just did talking about it. Just read it. Apply it. Let it sweep into your heart and make a difference. Shall we stand together? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your presence with us, for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the instructions that you gave Paul to write to the church at Thessalonia. Thessalonica, Lord. How, Father, these people came into a state of obedience and it was okay to be led by you. Thank you, Jesus. May your Holy Spirit work in us, making us what you want us to be. And may we not resist anything that you desire to do for us. And may our relationship with you be right. 
our understanding and relationship with our own identity, may it be correct. And Lord Jesus, may it then cause us to relate to the people in our lives in just the way you want. All to the glory of God. Thank you for your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Joe, would you pronounce benediction for us, please? In the name of Jesus Christ, may you live in peace with all people. May you be patient, encouraging the weak. May you break the cycle of retaliation against those who treat you poorly. And may you praise our God with a life surrendered to him. Go in peace.